Okay. Thank you very much for the organizer for the invitation. Um, I learned much of what I knew about image processing here in the group of uh, Jose Maria Carazzo in, in Madrid. So it's always a great pleasure to be back in Madrid and, and catch up with so many colleagues. So uh, today I'd like to tell you about not our image processing uh, work per se, but on a, on a relatively new focus in my group, which is on, on, on this protein uh, called Tau, which is a very close collaboration with a colleague of mine at the MRC, uh, Michelle Goodert, in the neurobiology division of LMB. The protein tau assembles into these aggregates in, in, a, in a number of neurodegenerative diseases. And the most frequent one, and perhaps the best known one, is Alzheimer's disease, where it, co it coexists with pathology of, of aggregated amyloid beta. But there's, a, a, there's more, than two, uh, more than 20 different neurodegenerative diseases where tau aggregates, and it can be uh, tau on its own as well, so uh, proving that just accumulation of tau itself can be. Um, pathologically as well. Now, from the histolog histological uh, way of looking at these diseases, they are very different. So different types of cells uh, get affected. And um, inside these diseases, the protein tau, which normally in its happy life is thought to stabilize uh, microtubules, and Eva Nogales did a beautiful structure of microtubule bound uh, tau uh, last year. Have lost me? Yeah. Um, when somehow what happens in these diseases is that these molecules uh, start to aggregate and form these amyloid-like uh, filaments, as, as uh, shown here. Now, when you do X-ray scattering of these, they have this typical uh, cross-beta pattern where you have a 4.7 angstrom repeat, which is caused by inter-beta strand distance when these form very long uh, beta sheets along their helical direction, and then a perpendicular 10 angstrom or 11 angstrom repeat, which is caused by these different beta sheets packing against each other. <coughs> now, tau in the human brain uh, occurs in six different isoforms. There's uh, two axons at the uh, end terminus of the protein, which can be uh, there or not. And then there's exon 10 here, which, which uh, codes for a microtubule binding repeat. And in, in full length tau, there's four of these repeats. And this is the region of tau that binds to the, uh, to the microtubules. And exon 10 can be spliced out, and then you have uh, what is called three repeat tau. So in total, there's three, three repeat isoforms and three four repeat isoforms. Now, interestingly, if you look at the inclusions, the aggregates of tau in Alzheimer's disease, there is a mixture of all six isoforms in those. But in other diseases, like Pick's disease, there is only three repeat tau in the inclusions. And, for example, in cortical basal degeneration or uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, there is uh, four repeat isoforms only in the, uh, in the uh, inclusions. Now, Tony Trout, back in the 90s, already looked with uh, Michelle at uh, filaments extracted from the brains of these patients in a negative state and saw that the morphology of the adhesives of the filaments was different. And more recently in Japan there was also work to look at limited proteosis because not all the amino acids of full-length tau participate in forming this cross-beta structure. Many of them kind of flop around in what is called the fuzzy coat and uh, you can cut those away with, with, uh, with a limited proteolysis, and then you can, he finds that there's different amino acids in these structured cores of these, um, uh, of these amyloid filaments. That, together with the observations that during neurodegenerative disease, tau accumulation seems to spread from um, specific foci in the brain to. Uh, oh, ooh, that's interesting. Oh, it's, it's my fault. Hmm? It's your fault. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, at early stages, it starts in specific regions of the brain. Again, different diseases, different regions uh, where it starts. And near the end, you, you then have tau pathology uh, throughout uh, the brain. So together with the observation, uh, and this then uh, comes from, from the prion field, that you can have these kind of amyloid-like aggregates, which can convince otherwise happily unstructured proteins, which tau in its happy life is mostly unstructured, can be convinced to aggregate, to, to build on top of these of these initial seeds, and they grow, and then they can break into pieces, and, and they can spread throughout your brain. So that kind of fits with observations that Michel made. If you have mice overexpressing human tau, and you inject them brain extracts from patients with these tauopathies, you can reproduce the uh, pathology of the disease, of the specific disease, in these different mice. And he did this with a number of, of diseases, and I'll show you some slides of, of PSP here. So that then 
raises the question, does Tao behave somehow like a prion? And are these different uh, I sort of, these different types of filaments that Tony already saw in the 90s, could they be kind of different uh, prion-like strains that each encode for a different disease? So how that would work at the, at the atomic structure level was unknown, so we thought uh, uh, that structural biology could fill a gap here. So the first structure I'll show you was driven by a postdoc in my lab, Anthony Fitzpatrick, who's now at uh, the Zuckerman Institute in, uh, in New York. And uh, as I, I mentioned before, all the uh, work is in very close collaboration with Michelle Goodert. And we get our brain material from, from Dino Gatti, who's in Indianapolis. Uh, so we started with the brain of a 74-year-old uh, female who had died of, of Alzheimer's disease. And this is actually a picture of her other half of the brain. Uh, the other one half gets frozen just a few hours after death, and the other half goes through a normal uh, neuropathology kind of uh, staining procedures. So we took uh, cortex regions, and then you can do light microscopy, or you can do negative staining microscopy, similar to what Tony saw in the 90s. In AD, we see two types of filaments. There's what, what Tony called the paired helical filament, which is kind of wide, narrow, wide, narrow. And there's something which he called the straight filament because it, it lacks that kind of variation in thickness. Now, of course, then, with the revolution in, in microscopy hardware, detectors, and, and also in software, we thought it would be a good time uh, to uh, go back to the work done by Tony in the 90s and try and do cryogram on this. So this is at various stages of purification. We can get these filaments relatively pure onto cryon grids, and this is an image taken in our, in our cryos, where you can see here paired helical, which are narrow, very, very intense, and then wide, much dimmer, narrow, wide, etc. cetera. But this is, is a straight filament. Now, this work uh, kind of coincided with a very uh, brilliant uh, PhD student in my group, Shauda Hay, having uh, more or less finished his implementation of how to deal with helical symmetry inside our image processing program uh, rely on, and thereby everything kind of was in place to do um, uh, atomic resolution structure uh, determination. And uh, this uh, indeed succeeded, and Anthony managed to get uh, around three and a half angstrom resolution reconstructions of both the paired helical filament and the straight filament from this AD brain. So, um, this, just to remind you, so there's very long helix. This is an XY cross section of this. And here you see one amino acid chain will go through here. And this in the direction that is now coming out of the plane, or here inside uh, the plane of the slide, is each time you move up 4.7 angstroms to have a new beta strand, uh, making a very long uh, beta sheet in that direction. And then while you do that, you turn about one degree or so. So you very slowly twist this thing around, which gives that twisted appearance in the micrograph. So this is a close-up view of the paired helical uh, filament structure. Of the total uh, uh, number of 441 amino acids of the full-length tau isoform, only residues 306 to 378 are actually structured in this, uh, in this amyloid structure. So there's a 305 residues flopping off in this fuzzy code on the N-terminal side, and 70 odd ones on the uh, C-terminal side. Now this structure has a, a, a helical uh, two-fold screw axis in the middle, so, such that you have two identical copies of this kind of C-shaped protofilament structure. Now this, this straight filament, uh, surprisingly to us, had these exact two same uh, C-shaped protofilament structures of made of the same 306 to 378 amino acids, but rather than packing against each other in a symmetrical manner, they did so in a very asymmetrical manner. And in particular, there's here four lysines, which seem all to be around this kind of big blob of density, which we don't think, we don't really know what it is. It must be some kind of anionic um, molecule because of the positive charges of the lysines, but this, we think, keeps together the, uh, the straight filament. Now, if you overlay the protofilament structures of the, both the PHF and the SF, then they overlay quite closely, and this then makes these two types of filament that we call uh, ultrastructural polymorphs. But they do share this, this uh, what we call the AD fold, which is this three, the C-shaped uh, fold of the, uh, of the protofilament, so one half of the structure. Filament. Now, that's fine, but then you can say, oh, that's one lady who died of AD. Would the next person who dies of AD have the same type of filament, or is this something that, that changes? Um, 
we don't seem to ask those questions if you overexpress your protein in E. coli and solvent structure. But of course, this is pathology. This structure is not not converged by evolution to do a specific uh, specific function. So we did another three patients uh, using TrioEM, uh, using uh, data both at home and also at the uh, diamond facilities uh, in Italy. So, and we can see that for the four different patients that we've done, and one of them was a familiar form of, of AD who had a mutation in the amyloid precursor protein, uh, not really, but that's kind of upstream from tau pathology. But all these structures, you can see, they have PHFs and SFs, and the structure is actually the same. So we think if you have Alzheimer's disease, then you'll have these kind of structures in your brain. Now, the, the the structure of the protofilament actually now can explain why you can have both three and four repeat tau isoforms inside AD filaments. And that is because the structure conveniently stops at the beginning of the third microtubule binding repeat. So whether the second repeat is spliced out or not, whether it's present or not in your protein, it doesn't matter. This flops out randomly in the fuzzy code, and you can just randomly incorporate either two, uh, three repeat or four repeat tau in, in, the, in the filaments. So that's then the, the model for tau filament formation in AD. Now, then Anthony left, and uh, Ben Falcon, who's a postdoc in Michel's lab, took over uh, the Cryam effort, and, uh, and, and Wen Jun Zhang, a postdoc in my lab, uh, assisted him. And together they looked now at a patient who had died of Pick's disease. And Pick's disease is a much rarer neurodegenerative disease, but we were lucky enough to get our hands on, on several cases. And there was one case which had actually, we could extract enough filaments to do a cryogram structure of. And uh, as you might recall, in Pick's disease, I, I mentioned before, only the three repeat isoforms of tau uh, incorporate in these filaments. So uh, this is a picture of the brain that, that we use. They have these specific pig bodies which the, the neuropathologists use to actually diagnose the disease. Uh, post-mortem, and if you look at it in, in, in cryogen, you can see there's narrow filaments, and there's filaments which are about twice as wide. We did the structure of both of them. The wide ones don't go very far, they go 8 or 9 angstroms resolution. The, the narrow ones go to uh, 3.2 angstrom resolution, but I hope I can convince you that the wide filament is probably a kind of head-to-head of -head dimer of the narrow filament. So again, we have two different types, and there seems to be like a common building block, which is this the protofilament uh, fault, which is uh, common between the two types of filaments. Now, this is the structure and the map of the uh, of the pig structure, and uh, I'll, I'll just move on to the kind of schematic view. In this case, uh, the structure actually starts here at lysine 254 of repeat number one. And remember, repeat number two is not present because this is only three repeat tau isoforms in the filament. So these isoforms go from K274 here straight to V306, and that's the uh, that's uh, here where the, that uh, that uh, jump happens. But you can see that even though 306 to 378 is again part of the of the protofilament structure, they fold up in a completely different manner in the pig structure, uh, where you now have this very elongated J-shaped structure. And if you now compare the sequence of the first and the second microtubule binding repeat, you can see that there are some mutations happening between the two, which make it impossible for the second repeat to actually fold in here. You have a beta branch veil in here for the second repeat, which will clash into the glycine in a very tight turn here. So there's no way that can happen. And there, there will be a steric clash of this threonine, which will become a lysine really banging into the serine here. So that kind of explains why in Pick's disease you only incorporate three repeats of uh, isoforms. Now, then we went on, and, and this might seem a little bit like cataloging different things, but every time we do this, we uh, get surprised. And as long as that's the case, we'll keep on doing this. So, um, um, Again, Ben and Wen Juan worked together very closely, and we looked at CTE. Now, CTE is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and if you expose yourself voluntarily, or perhaps involuntarily, it doesn't matter, to repetitive head, brain injury or head, head trauma, uh, for example, if you're a boxer, uh, then uh, you run a risk of developing neurodegenerative disease, which it sets in a lot earlier than AD, it also ha it's, it, it is a tauopathy. It again has a mixture of three and four repeat tau isoforms <coughs> in the filaments. But this time, unlike AD, there is no amyloid beta pathology. So this is 
And it's, it's the only tauropathy that we currently know is directly caused by some external recognizable event, which in this case is, is, uh, is concussion. So, in this case, we took the brains from one uh, ex-professional American football player, which is case one, and two ex-professional uh, boxers, which are uh, cases two and three. All three of them had died of, of uh, CTE. And if we now do the structures of the uh, CTE filaments from these patients, we again find uh, different structures. It resembles somewhat the AD structure, okay? It's not really in the close scene that it was, it's more like a, like a, like a, like a rectangular kind of structure, but as I'll, I'll show you on the next slide, the amino acids involved in these structures are the same. But the way they pack against each other again is very different from the AD. There's two types again, two ultrastructural polymers with a very similar kind of rectangular shaped protofilament structure, but again, how they pack against each other uh, differs for the, for the two uh, ultrastructural polymers. Now, thanks to beautiful data collected at EBIC uh, and, and Diamond, um, we and uh, image processing developments by Jasenko Zivanov, who was a brilliant uh, postdoc in my lab, who's now returned back to the biocentrum in Basel, where he came from in, in the first place. But he uh, implemented something that will come out with the upcoming Reliant 3.1 release, which is higher order aberration corrections. And we, we found that there was significant three and fourfold astigmatism in our data from Diamond. So the data was beautiful, but we had to correct for it. And then it, this structure went to 2.3 angstrom's resolution. And at that resolution, we, we could start to see ordered water molecules in these analog structures. So just like in ordered proteins, you can have ordered waters in, 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 normal, in, in amyloids as well. And also we can see alternative side chain conformations which kind of explain how you can, you can, you can offset all these uh, repeating uh, charges uh, with each other. Now, if we now look at the CTE fold, uh, versus the AD fold, it's more or less the same amino acids that form, again, a kind of C-shaped structure, but it's more open, and uh, that's because there is, uh, there's a pair of leucine and serine which is actually switched inside out. So you have all these beta strands, the beta strands are connected by short little loops, if you like, and there's a switch. So in AD, the leucine is inside and the serine is outside, and in CTE, that's reversed. Now, what is cause and effect, we don't really know. We can only observe the final structure, of course. And then what we see is a, is a very strong density, and this is present in all three cases, okay, there it is, um, which lives inside this, in the, in the tip of the sea, if you like, which has been kind of opened up compared to the ADC. And this pocket is very, very hydrophobic. Most of the amino acids, with the exception of these two serines, are all hydrophobic residues. So what we think happens in CTE, that somehow some kind of hydrophobic cofactor co-assembles with tau, so it's no longer just the tau protein. So this, this starts building a picture where each of these different diseases has its own specific fold of these protofilaments. What does that mean? We don't really know yet. And also, important, we don't really know how these different folds arise. So chemically, these are all, all the different patients from the same diseases have the same fold, but among them, they're very different. So there must be some specific chemistry going on. So future work will, ex will, will, we will try and keep expanding this catalog. As, as long as we're being surprised by our finding, I think we can learn new things from doing more. So we're, still, we're currently working on four repeat tauropathies, etc. Um, not all of these are very easy because sometimes the, the amount of filaments you can extract from brains is very low and then, then this becomes a big problem. Ultimately, we want to understand how different tau strains form and what their role is in the different disease, of course. And I think in order to gain that kind of understanding, some kind of in vitro reconstitution system is, is, is very uh, much needed. Now, traditionally, people have used the addition of heparin to overexpress tau. Tau itself is extremely soluble, it's very hard to aggregate. But if you add heparin, a polyanionic molecule, then it forms in vitro filaments. Now, we also looked at those, and uh, we found a whole mixture of different types of heparin structures you can form. And uh, sometimes they convert from one into the other, and we solve structures for four of these as well. And they're shown here compared to the CTE, the AD, and the PIC fold up here. And you can see these are all much smaller structures, perhaps topologically more simple. Uh, but again, this in vitro system is not 
uh, a good model system, I think, to, to understand the formation of these types of filaments in disease. So we need to keep working on our in vitro system to, uh, in order to find relevant uh, model systems. Now, questions there are, what could lead to these different types of filaments of disease? And this, this, this visibility of this cofactor in CTE, and we can see all kind of fuzzy densities around other filaments as well, is kind of, we're kind of now working with the hypothesis that perhaps there's other molecules apart from tau, which co-assemble with these filaments, and perhaps the, the, the presence or not of these type of, of cofactors in different types of, of uh, cells in the brain could provide hints to what, why you get certain diseases starting in certain uh, areas of the brain forming certain types of filaments. So how to study this? As I said, we'll keep looking and, and try and expand our catalog if we want, but ultimately, hopefully by identifying what these kind of cofactors are, we can then uh, develop better in vitro aggregation ma methods, models, which can then be uh, studied to find out uh, more about these devastating diseases. So my conclusions is my, my biggest point is that until now, each different disease has its own protofilament fault, much to the surprise of many people. People thought CTE would just be looking like AD. It is not. It's specifically very different. Well, perhaps not very different, but it's different, and that's what matters. It's chemically different. <coughs> and PID is very different from those two as well. So what, we've also, what we're also learning is that there is not such a thing as one amyloid structure for a given protein sequence. This is all this one, just one protein tau, and it forms all these different structures. So I think the, the functional form of a protein complex has converged evolutionary to do one specific thing. But amyloids, might, it might just be that this can happen in many different ways, which poses a serious question for, for model system, not only for tau, but for example, also for alpha-synuclein or TDP43, which are other proteins which aggregate from amyloids in neurodegenerative disease. Now, excitingly, I think we can now do this kind of atomic model generation from patient tissue this is, an, this is a whole new aspect of the cryon uh, revolution, and this will, it will make it applicable to a whole lot of other diseases, and um, yeah, we're very excited about that. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, ben, Wenjun, uh, Jacinko Shouda, and Antti, I mentioned th these are the real hands-on people in the lab who've worked on these things. Tony, Alexei, Gary, give all kind of advice, Mark. And these are the people that provide us with brain material. These are the people uh, perhaps seeing the patients themselves, and uh, we couldn't do the work without them. And as I said, all of this in very close collaboration with Michelle Bedford. We are soon going to be looking for a postdoc to work in these kind of projects, so speak to me. And also our division of structural studies in LMB will soon be looking for a new group leader kind of interested in methods development in structural biology in a very wide range. So again, speak to me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.